Hey everybody, <laughs> welcome to tonight's candidate forum, uh, which is an equal time Q&A. So with us are the two candidates, Kelly Bresnahan and Matt Gambino. Kelly has uh, completed three terms on the school committee and running for a fourth. And, I'm, and Matt, you've completed two terms and running yet for your third. So I'd just like to say on behalf of the town of Duxbury, thank you very much for your service and uh, thank you for stepping back into the ring again. Um, I, I'm quoting Tom Drummy, the gentleman that was in here just now, the head custodian, the Chandler, and he says, you, you, both of you have served during some interesting times. <laughs> and so it's great to see that you're still willing to come back and, and run for another term. So, so thank you very much for that. So, uh, so tonight, uh, the ground rules is um, we'll start off with uh, prepared statements uh, from both Kelly and Matt, and then we'll go through uh, eight questions probably about two minutes each, each person. And uh, so prepare remarks, questions eight, and then final closing remarks to kind of wrap up. Then we'll uh, open it up to, to the audience. <laughs> Lester, welcome. <laughs> That's right. So for any questions uh, from the audience or from those uh, uh, who have uh, logged in and are with us on Zoom. So uh, with that, I think we're ready to go. All right. Oh, by the way, before uh, before the uh, the forum started, uh, Kelly elected uh, asked uh, Matt to go first for briefing. So, just want to make it clear. Put Matt in the hot seat first. <laughs> Open prepare remarks. Open remarks, Matt. Please. Thank you, Fernando. And I also want to thank uh, the Duxbury Free Library and the Board of Trustees for arranging this event. Uh, so, thank you uh, both for that. Uh, my name is Matt Gambino. I'm running for my third term for school committee. Uh, I'm running because I can't think of any other position in municipal government that is more important than supporting uh, the academic achievement of our young people. And it's really as simple as, as that. Um, I've worked in education. I'm almost displeased to say like over 25 years. I can't believe how long I've been out of college, but uh, <laughs> my entire career I've been supporting um, uh, companies that support educators uh, from higher education publishing to uh, education technology companies that serve K-12 uh, to um, corporate training companies that deal in, in ethics and compliance. So I'm close to uh, education. Um, I'm uh, passionate about education and teaching and learning. And um, it just seems to me that that's in alignment with what our expectations are of school committee. And that's why I'm happy to run. Excellent. Thank you. Thank you, Matt. Great. Kelly? Thank you again for having us, Martha, for organizing, Lester, for coming. <laughs> um, I guess I would say I am a 22-year resident of Duxbury. I've been out of school a really long time, but um, education is my passion. I have a Master of Education from Boston College. I taught high school for four years, um, and when I moved to Duxbury, I became the, the ultimate volunteer. I've been involved, I have three children, two who've gone through the schools and one who is currently a freshman. Um, and I've served in every role since 2005. I think I started volunteering um, with PTA, with school councils, um, and now with the school committee. I've also been very involved in Duxbury. Um, I've served on the, for the Duxbury Rural and Historical Society as a docent. I've been on the Newcomers Club. I've served on Friends of the Library. Um, you name it, volunteering is in my soul. So, um, but school committee, you know, and, and people had asked me to run when my children were little and I said, I, I don't have time. I think you really need to be committed. Um, and it is a vital role for our town. I agree with Matt. I think it's a great um, place to put our energies. So that, uh, that's kind of me in a nutshell. All right. Yeah. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Right, uh, Matt, first question is, so like I said, you've been on the two terms now and going for your third. So what accomplishments are you most proud of during your tenure on the school committee? Oh, how much time do you have? <laughs> uh, well, I mean, I would say uh, over the over this last year, I've been um, fortunate enough to serve as as chair. And, um, you know, that has with a with some changeover in the school committee, I think it gave everyone on school committee a chance to sort of take a look at how our committee had been uh, doing things and where we had opportunities for improvement. Uh, I would say it's sort of a, at a high altitude level, there are a, 
small handful of things that I'm most proud of over the last year. So one would just be in the area of uh, communication to the community. Okay. So we, um, we've been struggling, the district has been struggling with a fairly antiquated website. And um, at least for the school committee pages, there's really been no ownership over, you know, um, sort of commandeering uh, in organizing information to ensure that the community was, you know, kept abreast of information in a, in a timely fashion. So um, when we reorganized last April, uh, I put forth a motion to uh, have the committee take over more ownership of that website. We voted on it. And um, since that time, uh, I would say that, you know, our sort of velocity of giving information has been a lot quicker. Um, we've been able to create um, what, you know, the, the traditional term is meeting packets. So previous to last year, um, all of us in school committee, we, we were getting our information some, sometimes the day of a meeting on like a Google Drive. It was that's, fairly dis uh, that's, fairly that's pretty tight. Yeah. yeah. It was, so it was disparate information <laughs> and it, it just wasn't really organized well. So um, I put forth a motion to put together what we call meeting packets and the um, the uh, the mandate is for those meeting packets to be made available to the school committee and to the public. Uh, at right. least two days in advance of every meeting. So if you're interested in attending a meeting or virtually attending a meeting or following along with the meeting, which a lot of, I've, I've learned a lot of our residents want to do, right. you can just go on and see all of the documentation that we're, we get our information from and that we're working from uh, in a meeting. And that includes even the meeting minutes from the previous meeting. So, you know, folks are able who right. really, you know, want to nerd out on it can make right. sure that you know, what we have decided upon in the previous meeting is memorialized correctly in that meeting, right? So the website, the, um, the, the meeting packets, and I would say the, the third item around communication that I'm fairly proud of over this last year was uh, putting forth a motion to pilot a virtual office hours program. So um, what we do now is once a month, uh, every commu community members have a chance to sign up over, you know, the Sign Up Genius platform to meet a member or two. So we can't operate as a quorum outside of meetings, but two right. of us can. So if you're interested in having a 20 minute meeting with one or two school committee members to talk about what's on your mind, concerns, ask questions, you're able to do that. And I'm like totally thrilled with it because uh, more often than not, every slot is always filled up. Uh, so it's been very helpful for me. I can't speak for the other members, but that sort of, you know, um, you know, those tenets around communication and improving communication to the community, I think are vital and I'm really proud of it. Actually, that's some good ideas for the select board. So maybe I might take you up. <laughs> you betcha, you just gotta give me credit. He's the <laughs> tech guy. Sorry, to, right. Hi. Hi. Hi, John. No, join. Oh, please. Excellent. Hello. Hello. James. Hi, James. What? Kelly. See you. So Kelly, uh, thank you, man. Uh, same, same question. Three years going to four, what, what, what are you most proud of? Well, I have a lot of things that I'm proud of. Um, I think seeing the district change and grow um, since I started on school committee, I've worked for three different superintendents or they have worked for me, however you wanna look at that. Um, and I think just being able to um, have relationships in a working board with so many different personalities to me has been fascinating. Um, because when people rotate on and ro rotate off, there's always, oh, how's it going to be now? Um, and I think the fact that everybody brings a different skill set to the board and that we've been able to recognize that I've been vice chair a few times, I've been chair a couple of times, and I really tried to tap into everybody's strengths. Um, and I'm not a micromanager, so I, I like to have that cooperative skill set. And I've been on the um, salary negotiation committee for and have negotiated two union contracts with our teachers, um, Unit A, and I'm really proud of that. We have an amazing staff in Duxbury, um, and to recognize them and to come to an agreement between them and the administration is fantastic. And probably the hardest, I don't know if this is a different question, but something I'm very proud of is um, definitely through COVID. Um, I was the chair through COVID. It was not easy. Um, people were coming from all different directions and we only knew what we didn't know. 
So it was extremely difficult. And then we had a few other curveballs thrown at us that school year. Um, so I'm just proud of, I guess, getting through that and, and having the district come out on the other side and seeing what we're doing for remediation for students and for mental health. So that's great. I was, I was able to observe some of the from a distance, right? All the the uh, tensions and uh, yeah. between parents and the school during a very difficult time. So, yeah, tough. Yeah, it was it was tough, and uh, yeah, quite rightly should be proud of that. Right. Next question, then. Um, so, Matt, why are you running for re-election? <laughs> <laughs> uh, what well, are your priorities for for another term? Why am I running? What are my priorities? Yes. Well, like I said in my my opening statement, I just can't think of anything that's more important than this particular brand of service. You know, you know, supporting the education of young people to me is is vital. So that's why I'm running. I'm I'm not running on any particular one agenda. I'm not supposed to run on a particular Correct. one agenda, and you don't want me to run on any one agenda. So um, I would say that my priorities are in line with. What I think we've been fortunate enough to have bubble up as a result of our strategic plan over the last uh, couple of seasons, um, and so there are four, you know, objectives in that strategic plan. One is to strengthen partnerships between the school and the community. Two is to create uh, a, and establish more of a vertically aligned curriculum from pre-K to twelve. Three is to improve. Um, the communication system around our financial situation uh, so that everyone feels that they have a collaborative uh, role to play in helping to shape our budget and our budget priorities so that we can you know ensure that we you know hit our our budget numbers and we also want to practice inclusive instruction um, so those are the four priorities that I hope to be um, you know an integral part of as a, as a school community member uh, over this next term great thank you. Kelly, really same question. So, why are you running, and what are your priorities for the next for your next term? So, I'm running, um, well, selfishly because my daughter is still in the school system, right? right? And I am running because we have a relatively new superintendent. I think she has amazing initiatives. I would like to help see those through, and to help facilitate that. I'm running because. Um, Duxbury is very unique, and I think we have a community that is completely involved and educated, and I love harnessing um, that information and that knowledge and helping to, to be a bridge between the parents and the schools. And I think I have done a good job in town listening to folks and um, Really, and I think right now what's important to me being um, a parent of high school and older students is, is getting to um, get the energy of the younger parents, the Chandler and Alden parents, who um, I might not be as much involved with, but who are going to be the ones really to sort of take over the schools and, right. and it's their children. Yeah. Um, so I, I think, you know, your number one priority is your child. Right. So that um, we, we need to understand there's a lot of emotion involved. Um, all kids learn differently. I believe in the theory of multiple intelligences. Um, I think that just really advocating for the kids and for the curriculum that is appropriate and um, helping our district grow within our budget confines because we are we've always had budget shortfalls, but I think the next couple of years, it's going to be really, really tough, and we're going to have to make some hard decisions. Thank you. I'm going to go ahead and. You're going to throw a curveball, Fernando? Is that no, no. I'm just that actually some questions from the Duxbury Student Council Junior oh, class. So oh, I'm just cool. yeah. So I'm going to bring up one of their questions here. So uh, on that theme of, of strategy and, and what are you planning to do for the next uh, for your next term? So maybe kind of building on that, maybe a little bit more specific, uh, one of the questions was, what changes are you looking to implement in the school system? Matt? Um, I think that, uh, you know, a, a natural change that has to occur is how we sort of reckon and deal with the impact of a year and a half, some odd of, uh, you know, forced isolated learning right. outside of the school. 
that that's going to have an impact any way that you slice it. It's going to have a significant one, and it's not a positive one. So um, I think that the the change that we need to make is just a forced change of understanding how we can all work together, the school administrators, the teachers, the parents, the students as well, uh, and the taxpayers to ensure that we're just making responsible decisions to help sort of shore up uh, what that, you know, what, what those consequences were. And I would also add to that that, you know, my sense is, is that those consequences vary in degree based on a lot of criteria, not the least of which is the age. Right, so you know, kids in, in high school are going to be impacted in a certain way, but that mo most likely is just wildly different on how the little ones were impacted at Chandler and, and Alden. So I don't have any plans to you know paint the walls polka dot or anything like that, or make any sort of you know some sort of changes that way. But I just think based on some external forces, we need to sort of just sort of readdress how we look at education and how we look at things. Uh, and do it in a collaborative way to help sort of repair the damage that was made from sort of forced learning over Zoom. Great. Kelly, same question from the uh, Duxbury Student Council junior class. All right. So what, uh, what changes are you looking to implement in the school system? I think it's a change that we've started to make, but to continue on with is the mental health, really focusing on the mental health of our students. Yeah. Um, partly because of COVID, partly because of just who they are. The, the kids nowadays are a complete different breed than we were. You know, we're that generation that just went to school and sat in desks and did what we were supposed to do. And you had to ask to go to the pencil sharpener. You go in a classroom nowadays and there are kids everywhere, right? right? Oh yeah, it's incredible. Um, and the teachers are just masters. Like I don't, they have so much going on in the classroom. Um, so I think just really supporting our teachers to recognize the needs of their students and to have the tools um, and the resources to be able to manage um, different, and mental health is such an all-encompassing term. It can be something that happens one day, or it can be something that a student faces um, chronically. And I think we have come up with a lot of programs, and I'm looking forward to um, to see what we can do to further our assistance with the student body, K through 12. That's it, thank you. That's what's nice is that you have a set of prepared questions and then as you answer, there's a lot of questions kind of go out the window. So I'm just, uh, bear with me one so second. So we have like just 30 seconds left, is that what you're saying? <laughs> We've answered that. <laughs> I mean, you've already answered the COVID question, right? So that, that, that one, yeah, I mean, that's, that's right. Um, Let's go back to the, uh, to uh, to the budget, mm. All right? So as as you heard at the at the annual town meeting, um, is that uh, we're going to be challenged this coming year, uh, not this coming year, but the, the next uh, uh, budget season, so to speak, yeah. right? Once we go through that, um, yeah, everybody's talking override, and uh, everybody. I don't think there's many people keen on override, right? But uh, at the end of the day, it impacts everybody's uh, pocket. However, you know, schools are our priority, uh, are our important role, play an important role in our society and our community, right? So, man. Uh, that was a wonderful lead up to a to question the, that I, I haven't heard I just, yet. I'm reading the question, right? Oh, okay. I just make sure it's <laughs> consistent. <laughs> so how will you, as a school committee member, work with the town to achieve those demands within the constraints of the budget? I, there's already talk about more teachers, more uh, there's just more activity, more demand uh, mm -hmm. that that needs to be satisfied for 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 the schools, but yet there is this constraint. Um, how are we going to work with the town to uh, to achieve the goals of of the school committee of the schools, but within that uh, within that challenge of uh, finding money? Uh, well. Couple things come to mind right away. So um, we were talking about accomplishments over over the last year. So when we reorganized, one of the things that struck me was that we, you know, quite literally only had one subcommittee um, that was officially okay. set up by the by the school committee. What we didn't have was a budget and finance subcommittee. So I encouraged the committee to think through and to raise a motion to create a budget and finance subcommittee. All the other districts that I know of do it. And I felt like it was an important priority for us to do. So what are some of the sort of the outputs of this first year and what would we be looking for moving forward? Um, well, I think one of the really uh, 
in, encouraging outputs from this year is that we were able to assign two school committee members to you know dig deep on issues that are associated with the budget. So what does dig deep mean? Well, subcommittee, as you know, subcommittees have the authority to schedule public meetings with the superintendent and other administrators uh, outside of regular school committee meetings to focus on specific topics like the budget. And uh, I can't speak for the other school committee members, but you know, just you know, participating in school committee meetings, I'm energized by the fact that uh, I feel like the they're they've done a great job this first year and will continue to do a good job of helping the administration and they themselves tell the story of where our budget needs are. So that would be one thing, sort of subject matter expertise and sort of a deep dive into the budget priorities with a subcommittee. But the second item is you mentioned work with the town. Um, I think it's incumbent, I think it's a responsibility of all school committee members to form partnerships with the other committees and volunteer associations in town to be able to have a discussion and share some mutual understanding around where the real needs of the schools are. You and I have talked in brothers before in the toilet paper <laughs> or you know after a, after I think last year's meeting That's to right. finance committee and we were talking about um, you know the uh, the addition of some some tutors in, in in math. And I think that you know we talked about COVID and everything. We need tutors. We need to be able to at all levels of instruction tutors are vital. It's not even a controversial statement. I just don't think it's scalable. So, you know, one of the things that I've mentioned in school committee meetings and that I mentioned to you, uh, you know, offline is that, you know, I, I continue to advocate and to suggest that the, the, the administration um, consider, you know, ways of scaling tutoring. You know, there are, there are organizations out there that provide virtual tutoring services that have licensed state certified instructors who are begging to work with districts on a, you know, on a, on a sort of a contractual basis uh, to be able to dole out uh, tutoring instruction. And to me, that's cost effective, it's strategic. And when you talk about sort of working with other town officials to sort of, you know, work on what the budget needs are, that should be music to other, you know, finance committee and fiscal advisory's ears. You know, if it's, if it's, uh, you know, if it's possible to do and it's cost effective, we should definitely be looking at it. Okay, great. Kelly, to the same, same question to you. So uh, how will you as a school committee member work with the town to achieve those demands within the constraints of the budget? So I've worked with the town for years. I've sat with Renee Reed, um, John Q's come to our meetings. Um, I, I'm, I'm a very pragmatic person and I understand that there's only so much money, right? Right. So I think for me, what, I, I go through our school committee budget line by line by line. And I think the superintendent puts together um, from her administrators, a very cohesive, reasonable budget for what she thinks is the best for our schools. And if the town says, well, you can only have two point whatever percent, then I think it's our role as school committee members to sort of go through the budget and question, do we need X, Y, Z and, and put things on the chopping block? Um, I don't think the town, I think it's a very tough situation because we're all property taxes. Um, I really don't think there's an appetite for an override. That has been talked about for a few years and I don't think it's reasonable. So within our confines, um, we need to advocate for our students and maybe give some pushback to the town if they say we can't you know, they don't want to give us X amount of money. Yeah. Um, we can advocate this is why we need X amount of money. And, and it's really a juxtaposition in Duxbury because um, parents expect the best for their students in AP classes and music enrichment and right. art classes. And but we can't support all that, unfortunately, with our tax base. So we have to make some really tough decisions. Um, and, and if we you know, this year we used, we had a big discussion about do we continue using the ESSER funds for tutors or teachers? And the answer was yes, because if we can get them paid for now and we're still remediating from COVID, um, then we use them. Next year, if we have to make some cuts, then if it's not staff, maybe it's to music instructors or, you know, it'll have to be what we're facing. 
So I, I think it's um, it's a very tough role, but I also understand that there's only so, so much money. You know, I'm sort of that old Yankee, you can't spend what you don't have. Yeah. Um, so we just need to spend it wisely. And I think education nowadays, the way kids learn is so different. Um, it's really tough to, to meet all of the needs of the students without having um, a pretty significant budget. I have a follow-on question. So I've been a member of the, the, of the uh, finance committee and uh, I think the question that always has been is uh, building on what you, what you said, Matt, is how do you tell the story, right? So uh, you, you, we always talk about, there was the, the old way of saying things, you know, you, how much money you're spending per, per teacher was mm -hmm. a metric that was used historically to say we need, to, we need more money. Uh, but that to me is, is an input. Uh, uh, how do you tell the story about an output in, in terms of we need this because we will achieve this? I think that's that's something about telling the story. Have you, have you had, uh, on the school committee, has there been any discussions uh, along with school administration? How do you tell the story that if you spend X, we will achieve Y? That's a great question. <clears throat> but just a point of clarification yes. is when you say Per teach, do you mean per student? Per pupil. But there, there was one time that uh, I remember in an annual town meeting, there was a, a salary per, 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 teacher. Uh, per teacher was shown up. Wow. Yeah, yeah. At one of our town meetings, or are we going yeah, back yeah. to like the it, it 1700s the previous, when they had the thing? Okay, all right. It was the previous administration. <laughs> I see. Okay. I, I, I remember that. Chart. I don't remember that. Okay. But, but then it, well, it changed and became uh, how much money we were spending per. For students, mm -hmm. yeah, as, so as the a state metric, does right? it, yeah, as the way the state does it, yeah. But it, again, it's it's a, it's more of an input. It, it, again, you, you can spend a lot of money and spend it uh, unwisely, yeah. So how do you know yeah. to answer your to basically yeah. uh, spend it wisely? Yes. Uh, how we you know basically what sort of outcomes you're looking for? So it's about telling the story. Uh, um, so that's the question for you, Matt. And then you can mm -hmm. is, is how do you tell the story that that do you need this money? because you want to achieve these things? Yeah, well, um, it's a good question. I think that um, there's no better motivator uh, for uh, people in the community, particularly parents in the community, than fear. And so when I think one of the, <laughs> one, one of the outputs that I think that we you know, have to be very frank about is, yeah. um, I mean, a good example is class size, right? So right. If, we, if we don't do an override, let's say, or if we don't sort of you know, you know, advocate for a certain amount of money, then you have to make cuts. That's, again, sure. it's a non-controversial statement. So if we make cuts and those cuts you know, have to manifest themselves into cuts on staff, well, then that starts to mess with our student to teacher ratio. And yep. so when we start to, and we've seen it over the last few years in certain uh, you know, pockets in the middle school, you know, it, unfortunately, we've seen very high student to teacher ratios in middle school, I think it was That's right. three or four years yeah. ago, and uh, talk about getting people to town meeting, that was, you know, that was a, <laughs> that was a big issue. Right. Another issue a few years ago was, uh, you know, having a reckoning around making some cuts to the um, to the um, Mandarin Chinese language learning. I, I remember that. Yes. Yeah, again, very, you know, you know, just healthy debate, healthy yep. concern hearing from the parents in the community on how important it is to make sure that we're preparing our students to be competitive in the 21st century workforce. And I think to a lot of parents, that means being able to speak Chinese okay. and do business over, right. overseas. Um, so when I think of output, that's, that's what I think of. I think of you know, acting in a way that enables us to be able to continue to operate at, um, at a reputation that we've you know, inherited over the, you know, over the last few decades. Um, so when I, when I think of output, that's that's what I think of. Okay, great, thank you, Kelly. Same same question. Sure. Yeah. Um, you know, output sometimes is hard. Sometimes it's difficult if you're looking for data. You know, we have MCAS. All right. of, pretty much all of our kids graduate high school because they pass the tenth grade MCAS. Um, and if we see that there's an issue, then we remediate. Right. So that might be where oh, eighth grade they haven't learned geometry yet. Maybe we need to change the curriculum for that. Um, some of our stuff is not as easily quantifiable. We have an incredible music program and we have sent kids to Carnegie Hall and kids go on and have amazing careers. Um, so you can advocate for the budget that way because we spend a lot of money on our music program, but, but look what we're, we're getting. We have scholar athletes. We have kids who go out to amazing colleges 
Um, I think that, you know, we really, we've started with a portrait of a graduate we've put together. So this is our expectation. When kids come out of right. Duxbury, you've given them all of these resources and we've maintained small class size and we have language instruction and we have all this and look at the type of student we're graduating, mm -hmm. whether they're going to a trade school, whether they're going to work or whether they're going on to a higher institution. They're well prepared to be global citizens. It's nice, thank you. Yeah. Excellent. Um, community engagement. So uh, school committee members need to consider the viewpoints of various stakeholders when establishing goals and policies for a district. As a school committee member, how do you stay engaged with teachers, students, and parents, as well as the community at large? Um, well, I love that question because I love uh, community engagement and I love talking to um, all sorts of members from the community with all sorts of, of different viewpoints. I can think back to you know, the unpleasantness during uh, COVID and we had uh, you know, just a, a large contingency of parents just like in all the other towns that I know of who were rightfully concerned that um, the kids were you know, taken out of school and they felt that they needed to be learning back in school and you know, working with, with, other, with other kids. So you remember that it was yeah. you know, uh, just a hotly, a hotly contested issue. What I felt was super, super important as a school committee member was not to sort of limit my you know, point of view to uh, public meeting as it related to community engagement. And so I can remember you know, we get a, we get emails some, from time to time from people in the community. It comes to the school committee uh, email address, and the way that you know we typically do it is that the chair, whoever serves as chair, will get back to that person. And you know, the form the former chair before last year during COVID, you know, wouldn't do anything wrong. But you know, the essentially the uh, the response was always thank you for your email. We're acknowledging receipt of your email, and that's completely fine. But there was no law preventing me from also sending my own email one on one to that community member saying like, I'd love to talk to you. And so during COVID, I mean, quite literally, I logged hundreds of hours of telephone calls with people in the community to, to listen and learn. Yep. We had some people here, they, we did not agree on a lot of the, you know, on points of view, but I respect everyone's points of view. Hopefully there was mutual respect for my point of view. And I can't think of one of those calls where I didn't leave the call and hang up and say like, man, I really learned something on that call yeah. because for me to think that I have all the answers would be just ridiculous. So I think of community engagement as just being just a real person and you know, using whatever um, you know, uh, power I have to be able to, to get close to folks in the community and hear their points of view. And it's getting back to those office hours. That was why it was important to me to put that motion on the floor and to build yep. that program um, and I'm proud of it because, you know, we get a lot of, uh, a lot of attendees and that just sort of tells me, I sort of, what I draw from that is there's a constant thirst for people in the community to be able to approach members of the school committee and have real conversations. I think when you say working with the teachers, that was part of your question. That's right. That's a little trickier. So, you know, we have, you know, laws and mandates that we have to be respectful of, um, I think it would, to me personally, I feel like it would be sort of overstepping a little bit to start to approach staff members that are under the superintendent right. and under her direct reports yep. to ask how they're feeling. Now, you know, Kelly meant the unit A, Kelly mentioned the unit A salary negotiation. I was on that subcommittee as well. To me, it's those types of, of meetings that are in private, their executive session, where we're able to really get a good understanding of you know what the teachers' points of view are, what their concerns are. So I always you know you know gladly participate in those conversations when when I when I can have. Thank you, Kelly. Same same question. All right. Yes. So you stay. How do you stay engaged? And how do you communicate? How do I stay engaged? Well, I'm always out and about in the community. People who know me know I'm an open book. Um, I will attend events. I'll talk to anybody at the grocery store. Um, my friends call me the mayor sometimes because <laughs> I just, having lived here for a long time, I know a lot of people and I'm pretty much willing to talk to anybody. And, and what I have always said is call me, I will talk to you. I think, I think people nowadays are less likely to talk to somebody. They just want to send an email, like you said, which is fine. Um, but I think it's always nicer to have a conversation one-on-one -on -one. 
Um, and I've been on the phone with parents who are crying because it's a special ed issue or whatever. And I think sometimes people just want to be heard. They want to be listened to. Um, you have to respect the fact, like Matt said, that maybe you'll have a differing viewpoint, but that's okay too. Um, or somebody might say, hey, you know, it's COVID, but I really want us to have graduation, you know, can we have it? Well, guess what? We can have it in August and it's going to be on the field and there's always a way to work things out. Um, so for me, it's just, um, I always say, please call me, please send me your own email, whatever. Um, or I'm constantly talking to parents out in the community. Nice. Yeah. Nice. Since you brought it up. Here. Matt, special education. Yes. So yeah. over the years, the school <laughs> special education program has been challenging both financially and, pro and programmatically. What is, what's your estimation of the current special education programs at our schools and what should be done to improve, if anything? Um, so uh, like the uh, subcommittees, we also have liaisons that we're assigned to on the school committee. And it, it seemed to me previous to last spring that our liaison program was very scattershot. I mean, we have liaisons that are associated with different committees in town that don't even exist anymore. So one of the things that I advocated for was to um, sort of organize our liaisons by topic area. And we ended up, you know, having a, a you know, a successful yes vote on that. And so we have two liaisons that are assigned to the, the SPED program. So I think one of the the things that I'm really happy about is just like in subcommittee, I feel like we have subject matter expertise where we can sort of dig dive, deep dive on SPED. Uh, as you mentioned, SPED is challenged. It's not just challenged in Duxbury, it's challenged everywhere. It could be argued that our public schools are not sort of adequately funded or set up to be able to meet the needs of every individual SPED student. And that's why there's systems in place to and, you know, ensure that uh, we, uh, you know, have levers that we can pull where kids would be able to get served outside of district if they're right. needs, okay. you know, if they if they need to. Um, I'm very optimistic about the future. We have a very strong, in my estimation, a very strong interim SPED director right now. We're between permanent SPED directors, and we hope to have a new SPED director on board uh, this this summer. Okay. And one of the things that that I looked for in the interim SPED director and that I will look for in the permanent SPED director is uh, someone who is just laser focused on being able to sort of, you know, walk that tightrope between serving the parents in a way that, you know, they need their kids to be served because no one knows these kids better than their parents. Right. But the other sort of side to that tightrope is being able to be responsible and lawful enough to work within the confines of how much we can serve that kid, that 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 child, um, in the district, and those two things don't always line up, right? And there's no one at fault for that. You know, if I'm a parent of a student with special education needs, I'm going to advocate for that student. I might even hire and hire an attorney to help me advocate for that right. student and ensure that I'm getting absolutely everything that my child is entitled to with regard to instruction. That that requires though that we have a SPED director and a SPED staff that has the you know, the, 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 the forthrightness to be able to say, you know, here's what we are lawfully able to provide. We can't go over it. So, you know, those, those conversations are incredibly difficult and people always, I think, walk away from those conversations very unhappy. I would just hope that we make sure that the kid is getting served to the extent that we are obligated to serve the child or to, you know, place the child in another, uh, you know, in another program where he or she can get the services um, that they need. That requires great leadership and it requires great leadership to be able to, you know, have special education teachers and experts that report to him or her that are able to, that are able to, to tow that, tow that line. It's a tough conversation. For mm -hmm. sure. No doubt. So kind of same question. Over the years, I won't repeat the question on any way. But yeah, so yeah, uh, what's your estimation of the current special education programs at our schools and what should be done to improve it, if anything? So I think currently what we're hearing from CPAC and from parents are the two um, 
the largest increase in special ed cases have been around dyslexia and ASD, which is autism spectrum disorder. Um, so my concern would be that we have um, enough staff, uh, enough resources, enough staff training in those disorders um, or those diagnoses. And I know we use instructional assistance a lot. So making sure that they are, they have the proper training. Um, because a lot of times in special ed classrooms, the teachers are called out to um, attend an IEP meeting or for another reason and to, to have somebody step into the classroom in their place. Um, you can't just have anybody go into the classroom. It needs to be a trained person. So we need to put resources to that. Um, so I think going forward, I wanna make sure our programs are rock solid. We've done superintendent, um, Klingman and Beth Wilcox, Dr. Wilcox, assistant superintendent have done a lot around um, Orton Gillingham and dyslexia curriculum work. Um, we're still hearing about um, identification needs. So putting some resources into that and then following it through, making sure because we all know that reading is the number one, um, I would say the number one um, measure of success for students. If by third grade they're behind, then they're going to be behind. Um, so making sure that we're, we're, you know, people worry about high school, but we really need to meet the needs of kids when they're younger. Um, and like Matt said, sometimes it's okay. We can't educate students here and it's okay to send them out. And it costs the district money. And that's where the budget comes in. It can get, um, you know, one or two students a year that we didn't budget for that end up going out of district that can eat into our budget. So, and that's, yeah. that's our operational budget. Yeah. Um, so it's it's walking a tightrope sometimes, but I, I honestly feel that the needs of the students come first. Um, so we need to do everything in our powers to to truly meet the needs of each student and what what he or she needs, okay. what Thank they you. need. Right. Exactly. This is a question again from the Duxbury Student Council junior class, and it's on uh, along this the line of uh, of inclusion and. Uh, I'm going to throw this one out. At last year's school committee candidate forum question and answer, a question on critical race theory was asked by a member of the public. Critical race theory is not a matter of curriculum, uh, curriculum concern, I know it's spelled going wrong, a curriculum concern at the Duxbury Public Schools, but still an issue in our community. What role does the, does the school committee play in the critical race theory discussion or does it play at all, or 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 what role does it play, uh, or how can it uh, kind of address the what's behind it, so to speak? I hope that's that question makes sense. Mm -hmm. It does, hopefully, Matt. It, it, it I, there's implication. It, it's it's about what role is a whole. The, yeah, what? Let me just re repeat it again, sure. right? CRT was asked at the last Q that last Q and A is not on our curriculum, so it shouldn't be a concern. However, it's brought up because it is a concern. It is an issue yeah. in our community, right? So what role does the school committee play in that discussion around critical race theory? But the, the whole conversation in a way you can, you can open it up to diversity, equity, and inclusion, so. So I, I, I think of my responsibility uh, in two ways, as a member, as an individual member, and then the member of a body. Yep. So uh, as an individual member, like I said before, I, I'm totally jazzed up about, you know, particular areas in that role in terms of being able to, to talk with community members. And a lot of my communicate, a lot of my discussion and communication with individual members of the community are around CRT. I was in this meeting last year, right. like the one that you're talking about when, yep. that, when that question came up. Uh, and you're right, it's not part of uh, critical race theory is not part of the Massachusetts curriculum framework. So it can't be found at all in sort of the, the curriculum that we are obligated or that the administration is obligated to teach. But the, the, but the district is obligated to teach uh, history and social science. And history and social science frameworks were created back in the 90s. And they have the last update that they had was like in, in 2018. And over time, that has evolved to include, um, I mean, I've got it written down here, concepts around racism, discrimination, right. and oppression. Yep. So those are, you know, those are mandated by uh, the mass uh, curriculum framework. Yep. They're part of our history and social sciences framework. So, the, so we, we, we talk about them. Um, 
I think that there's a primordial soup going around between CRT and DEI and SEL, because I always hear those acronyms sort of tr right. traded around with varying degrees of you know emotion associated yes. with them. Okay. So um, is diversity and inclusion and equitable treatment important? Absolutely. So, you know, if that if that 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 should be a priority in our schools, it is a priority in our schools. And it's something that I believe needs to be uh, needs to be addressed and it needs to be taught. And in some areas like history and social sciences, in the context of racism, discriminating and oppression, it has to be taught, you know? Um, social emotional learning, I think of social emotional learning at, in a lot of different ways. To me, social emotional learning has tentacles into uh, how kids right now are trying to operate in a post COVID environment after they've been out of school for a while, right? What sort of damage, what implications has that had to their ability to work, play nice in the sandbox with others? And to perform and to collaborate with people and to learn in in a classroom right because there's there's in, there's impact around that should we be teaching our kids uh empathy when it's when it's um when there's an opportunity to do it at varying degrees yeah i mean i think if there if a kid is acting up in an elementary school class and for a teacher it because maybe he picks on another kid for the teacher to say, how do you think that made that other kid feel? That's right. empathy, uh, yeah. <laughs> you know what I mean? So that's how I think of, you know, being able to, you know, impress, you know, values that are consistent with this district uh, onto children. They shouldn't take the place of math instruction, reading instruction, yeah. English instruction, you know, science instruction and, and stuff like that. But there, I, I think there are opportunities to, um, you know, ensure that our kids are, you know, uh, being respectful of one another and being respectful of themselves, regardless of what their race and ethnicity and, and stuff like that is. And the last thing I'll say is that, you know, I, I told this story last week to another group that I, I spoke to during COVID. I spoke to a gentleman um, who, you know, was meeting with me on other stuff, you know, other concerns around school. But, you know, in the middle of the conversation, he said, you know, I'm really worried about the CRT stuff. And I was in the middle of sipping my coffee, so I didn't have to answer him right away. So he kept talking and he said, you know, I, I have a lot of grandchildren in the school system and I don't want my grandchildren to feel guilty or bad about being successful. And so when I finished my coffee, I said, I don't want your grandchildren to feel bad about or guilty about being successful either. And if that, if, if that were to come up in any of our curriculum at the school, I have a real issue with it because right. we're not supposed to do that. Exactly. So uh, I haven't seen any evidence that we're trying to make people feel bad about being successful. And I would hope that we continue to, you know, not, you know, have that, uh, have that happen. It, it, it almost feels like the way you're talking about it, it feels like this is a kind of a core value, a, a, a kind of a fundamental, how we engage with people, how we learn, how we interact, right? Okay, so I, I think that's, that's what I heard, fantastic. Kelly, same, same, same question. Yeah, this is a loaded question. Um, you know, and especially as a former history teacher, I taught history, I taught U.S. history. All right. Um, one of my, two of my children have gone through U.S. history. Um, they've never been taught CRT. CRT was actually initiated in the 1970s. Um, and it was a college level course and it was to look at, um, it went into law schools to look and see if there are laws in the United States um, that were put in place um, to create inherent racism. Right. Um, and we didn't really hear about it again until 2020-ish. Um, and so I think the reason that CRT has become a buzzword is because there's such a concentration on DEI, diversity, equity, um, and inclusion. And I think as parents, they are getting DEI training at work and they're seeing their students um, in, in schools now where DEI is talked about. We have an amazing DEI coordinator, Caitlin Sheehan, That's right. um, and she's fabulous. And I, I wanted to know what exactly do, does that mean? What does it do? So I joined the DEI, her committee. I sat on it as a school committee liaison this year. Um, and it was really interesting for me because I didn't understand the difference between equality and equity. Um, and, and also interviewing um, Dr. Funk, who is going to be the high school principal, was really um, eye-opening for me. And this is what I love about being on school committee. I'm still learning. There are things that I just don't know. And equity doesn't mean you're taking away from anybody else. It means you're giving certain students what they need so they can be successful. And, and, and what Dr. Funk did in Barnstable was, um, and this came out of our 
um, I, I, I was on the CLE committee as well, the equity audit committee for Duxbury. And, and what our data, raw data showed is, is kids um, who fall into the categories of um, minority or lower income are less likely to take advanced place, placement courses. So what do we need to do? And Dr. Funk was saying, well, what do you need to do to help those kids take AP classes? It doesn't mean that X amount of kids or, or something's gonna be taken away from them. Right. It means that during school, during academic support period, maybe there's a tutor for kids um, to have access to so they can also succeed in, in academic support. So I think it's a lot of that. Um, the CRT itself, you know, to me, um, values are taught at home and, and, and like Matt said, kids learning empathy is not a bad thing. And, and it used to be the Chandler I care cat and the I care rules. And now yeah. it's the green rules and, and consequences have actions. Right. And I think we can all agree on that. And it's really hard in a public school to, to have a curriculum that's going to make everybody happy and to, um, to have things taught and teachers have, um, the ability to take the frameworks and teach it how how what best fits their um, pedagogy, uh, their strongest way of teaching, right? So I think if a, um, a parent might not like a certain teaching style or words that a teacher chooses, then that that's not a whole curriculum problem. That might be something that you talk to a teacher about or an administrator. Um, so I, I think it's a lot of things, but. Um, CRT definitely is not something that that we teach in in the public schools. Oh, that, and uh, thank you for the Duxbury Student uh, Council Junior Class for that question. Yeah, I think for that, sure. That was pretty. That, that was two wonderful answers from from different different points, but, but that centered around the the, the kind of a, a, a core about yeah a, a, a value, right? An empathy, a, a connection, uh, human beings interacting with each other. So. In a, in a wonderful way. So yeah. thank you very much for that. I'm looking at time and we're, we're getting, uh, yeah, we're, I think we've covered a, yeah, it passes quickly, doesn't it? Yeah. Okay. yeah. So I think, I think we've, we've, uh, we've come to the end of the, the questions. And so any, any final uh, statements, uh, I'll, uh, Matt, uh, any closing remarks or uh, you, you might want to leave? How long to, do I have for you? <laughs> you have, you've already used up. <laughs> I'm reclaiming my time. <laughs> uh, well, again, I, I, I want to thank the, the library and the Board of Trustees for, and Fernando for, um, you know, being generous with your facilities and your time to put this together. Vitally important and I'm just happy to, to be a part of it. Um, I am asking for, I'm going to talk to Owl right now, I'm asking for your vote. I, uh, <laughs> I would love to serve another term. Uh, on the school committee. I think that we've done some some great work. It's busy work. It takes a lot of time, at least 10 hours a week on a voluntary basis, but it's um, something that I really enjoy. And I hope to um, I hope to continue to, to do it and to serve the students of this district because they deserve it. So thank you. Excellent, thank you. Kelly. And same thank you for having us. This is great. Um, I look forward to serving what will be my last term um, I love getting into the nitty gritty of the curriculum. I love, um, my favorite part of being a school committee member is when the students come and present or receive certificates from us or awards for whether it be science fair or something that they've done in their classrooms because that is what it's all about. Um, that's what makes me happiest. And I, um, it's been really amazing for me to work with so many different people and different superintendents and, um, currently to see where where we're going to continue to lead the district in challenging times um, but exciting times so i uh, i look forward to the to the next three years great excellent uh are there any uh any questions from the audience yeah, both on zoom i any think everything that has been said it's been said, it's been said. <laughs> i think it has been said yeah, so i, I think okay. uh, i think uh, yeah <laughs> so I want to thank you, Kelly. Thank you, Matt. Uh, actually, you know, this is really good, actually. Um, uh, so thank you, Martha, for, for uh, uh, inviting me to do this because uh, tonight I've been able to, to basically have a, uh, let me see, get to know Kelly, get to know Matt even better. Um, we've, we've obviously talked, this is the first time I met you, but I, I come away really impressed with both of you. 
and uh, really appreciative uh, that both of you are running. And uh, boy, you, you, both of you are going to do fantastic. <laughs> uh, this was, no, seriously, I'm, I'm really, really impressed. And, and uh, I think we're very fortunate to have both of you running and, uh, and volunteering your time and, and your commitment, your energy, enthusiasm. It, it just came through uh, loud and clear. Uh, wow, we're, we're, we're a very fortunate community to have you both uh, volunteering to serve another time. So thank you, thank you very thank much you. to both of you. Thank you, Martha, for setting this up. And thank you for the library uh, for hosting this event tonight. Thank and thank everybody uh, who is attending on Zoom and, and, and here present. So thank you very much. Have a good thank evening, you. everybody. Thank you.